Well, I have the top of the hour, so let's begin. Let me welcome you. Welcome everybody to this week's Future Trends Forum. I'm delighted to see you all here. From the United States, a happy Thanksgiving to everybody. My name is Brian Alexander. I'm the forum's creator, I'm the host, I'm your chief cat herder for the next hour, and I'll be your guide to our conversation. The topic of enrollment in the higher education is one that we've been following closely since the beginning. Readers of mine know this is something I'm pretty obsessed with. And the focus of my obsession in many ways is the fantastic work done by the National Student Clearinghouse. Every few months, they produce an update giving us our best picture of students enrolling in colleges and universities across the US. They've been doing this for years, their work is vital, and just this semester, they've released a series of reports giving us a, our first real glimpse at how enrollment has changed this fall semester. Now, in order to dive into that, in order to learn more about it, I've invited the executive director and the president of research, Doug Shapiro. And let me just bring Doug up on stage so you can get to see him. Hello, Doug. Hello, Brian, how are you? Very good. Great to be back on your show. Well, thank you. It's great to host you. Always good to see you. Well, where are you coming from today? Because it looks like home. This is home, absolutely. Brooklyn, New York. Oh, nice. Nice. I was born not too far from there. Um, so, you know, we, we ask people to introduce themselves with a kind of tradition, and that's to ask a future introduction. Uh, what are you going to be working on? for the next year? What are the big projects and the big ideas that are top of mind for you? Well, we're gonna be, we're gonna be doing a lot more work on um, student uh, uh, success rates and mm. equity gaps among those, uh, things like persistence and retention and transfer and completions. And oh all that on top of what we've been doing most intensively, as you said, is the enrollment data. So we'll keep coming with the uh, uh, more frequent enrollment reporting, uh, as well as all those new topics. Wow, transfer data. That's some that's some serious dark matter to get into. <laughs> yeah, we, we, we started with our first big report on transfer um, just a couple of, uh, I guess, three months ago, at the end of, end of um, August and uh, specifically focused on what happened to transfer students during the pandemic. We really found some interesting things that resonate with what we're now seeing uh, and still seeing in the enrollments as well. Uh, excellent, excellent. Well, good luck with that expansion of your work. I'm a big fan and I'm really looking forward to it. Uh, friends, you should be able to see in the bottom left of your screen a kind of tan colored uh, box uh, or button, and that will uh, lead you directly to the most recent report released from uh, the Clearinghouse. Um, if you're new to the forum, what I'd like to do is ask our guest a couple of questions to get things rolling, but then I want to get out of the way and let you all ask him your questions. This forum is for you. Uh, so just to begin with, uh, I was struck, Doug, by uh, quite a few things in, in your report, and one is the continued decline in uh, enrollment, predominantly in undergraduate. Graduate enrollment went up a bit, but that was much smaller than the uh, undergraduate population. And this seemed to be just across the board, every race, every gender, just about every uh, state in the union, just about every swath of institutional type. Um, the only exception seemed to be that the, the handful of elite institutions actually grew. Is, is that right? Or do, can, you, can you nuance this a bit more? Well, that's largely right. I mean, there's there are lots of nuances, and I hope we can get into some of those. But uh, uh, different from what we saw last year, you know, in the first year of the pandemic, when almost all of the declines were taking place in the community colleges, mm -hmm. this year it's a much broader swath, and we're we're seeing a lot more declines at the four-year institutions, um, and particularly the the. Uh, less selective and broad access for your institutions, which in, in many cases are looking a lot more like the community colleges this year in terms of the loss of students. And um, so, you know, that's, I think that's really troubling uh, uh, for obvious reasons for higher education, but at the same time, it, it's interesting for the kinds of insights that we can draw from that about what some of the 
forces might be that have been driving the declines, uh, which seem to be, again, very different things going on this year compared to what was happening last year when we were, you know, um, in the middle of campus shutdowns. So what, what do you think, I mean, at, at a first approximation, what are some of those differences? Because we're, we're coming up on the third year of the pandemic, which is a terrifying thing to say, but, but it's true. And uh, some of the same forces are, are still present, the fear of infection, the struggles or successes of being online. What, what's making fall 2021 so different? Well, you know, I, so I think you're right that last year was almost entirely about the pandemic. Um, Students were uh, afraid to travel. They were afraid of virus transmission in classrooms and dormitories, and uh, they didn't—they just didn't want to be in college. And and especially um, for uh, students at community colleges and um, and some of the broad access four-year schools, many many uh, families were suffering financially from the recession, in particular. Yeah. And many of the students felt a need to do whatever they could to help their families, uh, including putting off college, going to work instead, even if that meant a low wage job. Um, but the fact that this year we're seeing those declines beyond just freshmen, beyond just the community colleges, yeah. we're seeing fewer returning or continuing students at four-year institutions and fewer undergraduates overall. That tells me that there's, there's more of a deeper set of questions being asked by students and families about the value of college. And hmm. that's, that's what really worries me now. I think students are much more leery of taking on loans. They're much less uh, confident that a college degree is worth it to begin with. Um, and I, I think those are more long-term, more permanent factors than, say, the pandemic, uh, which, you know, is, seems to be, uh, well, it's with us. So it's been with us a lot longer than many of us would have expected. but. I don't think it's a permanent thing. It's going, you know, eventually we will either defeat it or learn to live with it. And I think we're well on our way to both of those uh, resolutions. Um, but the, but the, the larger forces about family finances and affordability are, are really deep. And they've been going on since uh, for a lot longer. They were, they were starting before the pandemic and the pandemic has just uh, intensified, I think, some of those concerns. Um, you know, affordability has been declining for years as as tuition increases continue to outpace median household incomes. Um, and as much as financial aid can can make up for some of that, yeah. especially at the wealthier institutions, yeah. uh, the growing economic inequality in our country has meant that students and families are just much less confident about future earnings, about socioeconomic mobility. And uh, they've heard too many stories from too long about college graduates who are still working at Starbucks. Mm -hmm. First, college dropouts who are defaulting on loans. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, and a new twist this year, mm -hmm. I think, is that they're starting to hear more stories about people making pretty good money, or at least what looks like pretty good money to a high school student uh, uh, without ever having gone to college. Uh, we've seen a kind of inversion in the low wage workforce where wages are rising for low and even some middle uh, wage jobs. And that's, that's luring young people uh, out of college and into the workforce probably sooner than they would have would have done otherwise. So I think all those those forces are going to be with us for a long time and and very hard to change without large kind of cultural and political shifts. 
Well, that, that's a fantastic answer, Doug. Um, and, and you've hit on so many things. I, I tweeted out a couple of these because these are so important. Uh, and, and friends, I'm going to have one more question, but but this is this is going to be your time, uh, your time to float your questions uh, for our executive director here. Um, do you think, I mean, the total enrollment in American higher ed has been going down since 2012. Um, do you, and I, I know you, you look at present data, uh, but do, do you anticipate any rise uh, next year, any reversal of this trend in case we get the virus below pandemic levels um, or perhaps if the economy has uh, continued issues that might lead to more unemployment? Well, I guess it depends on what you mean by reversal. I, I think the declines will certainly shrink. Uh, we may start to recover a little bit of lost ground, but I don't see any 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 quick recovery. Um, even uh, the schools that have made some gains this year, uh -huh. um, that's relative to what happened last year, not relative to where they were two or three years ago. Uh -huh. And um, it's... I think it's going to be really, as I said, really hard to turn this around. How how far down are we now compared to when the pandemic started? We're about, my best guess is by the end of this uh, semester, once we have all the data in, we're, we're looking at about 1.2 million fewer students this term than we had two years ago undergraduates only 1.2 million fewer that's really huge and it's you know i tried looking back at old department of education data it's hard to find a two-year period where we've had anything like that decline i certainly didn't see any in the last 50 years um so that's pretty historic and um you know the the, the large the most the, the nearest we've come to that, so a seven, uh, almost an eight percent decline in undergraduates in two years, was very recently in in between 2011 and 2013, when undergraduate enrollments declined by like three and a half percent. So we're more than double that rate, and 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 that. That three and a half percent was basically from an all-time high, right? Yeah, that was yeah. that was where we, we we had just come down off the peak uh, enrollment of the Great Recession. I mean, community co colleges in 2011, 2010 yeah. were literally bursting at the seams. Yeah. So, you know, to lose three and a half percent was almost a relief to a lot of people at that point. Right now, losing we're losing. Uh, we're losing almost eight percent, and we we we've just been going down. That's not off a high. That's off of a long, steady decline of one to two percent a year over the last eight or nine years. Well, that, thank you for that. I don't mean thank you as in yay, what a rosy picture. <laughs> but thank you for that very clear, uh, concise, and sobering answer. Uh, friends, now is over to you. Now is the time for you to put your questions forward uh, to Doug Shapiro. Um, and again, if you'd like, just use the uh, raised hand button to join us on stage. I'll show you how easy that is. Uh, I, I'll even make a pretend Star Trek transporter noise if you want. Uh, or just hit up the Q&A box. And uh, we, we got a question uh, via Twitter. I guess it's not so much a question as a kind of sardonic comment. This is from our good friend Donald Clark in uh, Scotland. Uh, he asks, maybe parents and students are right to be skeptical of higher education now. I think there's something to that. I really do. Um, and I, and it's painful to, to say that, to be honest with you. I, I think that, um, you know, higher education in, in many ways is not really selling an education anymore. They're selling a ticket to a better job a ticket to a well-earned job. And, we, and we've been selling this message to students for a long time. Um, and, and so if students don't see that economic return, they're really, that's the core. 
that's what I'm talking about in terms of this question of the value of college. And a big part of that is, is not just the economics, but, the, but what's happening in colleges and universities themselves in terms of student uh, success and completion. And, you know, the, the, the rates of gra graduation rates have, haven't budged in, in years. Um, and, um, when, when student, you know, the students who aren't graduating, students who, who attempt college and don't finish, those are, those are students who will, who will, who, who, who feel like they've been really sold a false bill of goods in terms, of, you know, even, you might say, oh, well, you got a year or two of education, you've learned a lot about yourself and et cetera, et cetera, but that's not what they came for. They came for that degree that's going to give them a, a ticket to a better job. Well, that's that's a really good answer. And Doug, thank you for that question. Uh, we have some questions that have just come in, and I'm going to lead off with one of the video questions. Let me uh, put uh, Jordan Davis on stage. Just so you know, Jordan is suffering from an incredible burden. He's a student at one of my seminars at Georgetown. So um, please, please be kind to him. Uh, he needs all the help he can get. Welcome, Jordan. Hey, Brian. Hey, Doug. Um, first, I want to say Brian is an, is an amazing professor in our program, so no burden at all. I actually have class with him tonight, so I'm sure we'll talk about some of this in our class tonight. Uh, but thank you again for your time, Doug. I, I have a question about um, college affordability in the U.S. Um, considering that several nations around the world have a uh, a free four-year degree model, and in some countries, are a free, um, you know, master's degree and even PhD model. One, do you see? Is it possible for the U.S. to adopt this model um, sometime soon? You know, allowing students to uh, allowing students to obtain a four-year degree for for free, free of tuition. And then, if it is possible, what kind of effects would this have? on enrollment and then also just like our economy as a whole i know those are two really big questions but um if you could just like speak to your thoughts on you know what a college what a free college system will look like in the u.s and what effects mm -hmm. that will have on enrollment good question yeah well um i i can't really speculate on on what's politically or economically possible for this country i mean uh Certainly other countries can do it. I, I don't know why we can't, <laughs> but it, it doesn't seem to be in the cards anytime soon. I think if it were to happen, it would it would have a huge effect. There's no question on on college enrollments and the willingness of students to uh, uh, to you might say take take the take a risk of spending time in college in other words uh you know, it's very hard nowadays to, to to look at current graduation rates and think that um you're it's hard to say it but i mean nobody goes to college without thinking but there's nobody goes to college thinking that that they're not going to graduate, that they're going to be one of those dropouts. I, I don't believe that. But if anyone takes an honest look at the data and, and sees that, you know, 40% of the students who start college in any given year uh, will have earned no degree and will no longer be enrolled, and will drop out with nothing six years later, or at least dropped out with nothing to show for it six, six years later. And that includes two-year and four-year students, wherever they started, wherever they transferred to, you name it. Nothing in our data shows any completion anywhere. And those, those, uh, you know, that's a huge that 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 forty percent is really in a bad place. They've got debt and they've got nothing to help them earn enough to pay that debt back. And that's really frightening to students. And if you take that, that risk of that worst case outcome, 
you know, we keep telling we keep telling people that uh, your earn your you know college graduates earn a million dollars more over their lifetime. Well, yeah, but that's an an overall average, and what what there's a real risk if you end up being ones at the bottom and bottom tail of that distribution that average. Um, if you take away that risk and you say, yeah, you know, of course you should give college a try. If it's free, you don't have that much to lose except a couple of years out of the workforce, a few years out of the workforce, right? You can get back on your feet. But if you're, if you're ending up with all the debt, you're not going to get back on your feet. Do you, Doug, do, do you, I want to build on Jordan's great question here. Um, have you noticed anything any enrollment differences in the states that have done some form of not complete public tuition but support like the tennessee promise or the new york uh, excelsior grant we haven't focused on community colleges in those states mm. but when we look at the overall i mean new york is a perfect example they've had some of the biggest declines of any state this year you know, particularly in the public universities in, in SUNY and CUNY, two-year and four-year institutions. So, you know, it's uh, it's hard to say. State policies are very different from state to state, um, but there doesn't seem to be an obvious relationship. I think the Tennessee case has probably attracted more uh, uh, traditional age students into community colleges than might have been expected. I think it's had less of an effect, and uh, I think the Paul they haven't actually opened it up to older students until very recently. So we yeah. probably won't yeah. see that yet anyway. It's quite an experiment. Uh, thank you, and Jordan. Thank you for the great question. Of course, yeah. Thank you, Doug, for your answer. I appreciate it. See you in a bit. Yeah. See you. See you later tonight. <laughs> Now, friends, if, if you're if you're new to the forum, that's a great example of a video question. So just press the raise hand button if you like to follow Jordan's excellent footsteps. And uh, while people are thinking about that, there are other questions that have come up. And let me just uh, toss these over the transom at you, Doug. Here's one from uh, Chris Aldrich, who says, you mentioned uncertainty in college graduate employment. Is this starting to put pressure institutions to accelerate movements for providing more concrete value, as in Kathy Davidson's The New Education? I think it is putting pressure on institutions to figure something out. Um, you know, what, what kinds of solutions they they settle on. Uh, hard to say if that's if that's the way to if that if, if that particular answer is, is going to catch on. It's an interesting question, though. It is, and if, just as a as a as a shameless plug, we've hosted Kathy Davidson twice now. Uh, so if you go to our archives, you can see our discussions with her, and she's fantastic to talk with. Uh, we have another question from the West Coast, Felix Zuniga from uh, California State University. And Felix asks, does the report break down enrollment by race and ethnicity? I'm thinking in particular about those students the university has, has historically been less successful at retaining prior to COVID. Good question. Yeah, yeah, really good question. We've spent a lot of time looking at race and ethnicity in our data. And we do break, the, break out the results by that, both for freshmen and for uh, uh, undergraduates generally. And um, uh, what, you know, it's, uh, some very interesting uh, transitions here, because in the first pandemic year, um, there were really clear gaps between, as we say, in the, in the, especially because so much of the declines were focused on the community colleges, where uh, the disadvantaged uh, uh, students we're doing much, much worse in terms of enrollment um, than, uh, than, than, well, a little complicated. Whites, uh, yeah, white students fell the least. Black and indigenous students fell the most. Um, and, that, you know, by, by a, roughly a factor of two. Uh, in, in terms of the percentage declines. Um, and again, those were the, the I think, among the, the socioeconomic 
uh, groups in community colleges that community colleges traditionally serve the most affected by the pandemic and the recession. But this year in 2021, when you look at the changes from last year to this year, white students actually uh, declined the most steeply at four-year institutions. And even in the community colleges, they declined second only to blacks in the, in the rate of decline at community colleges. Um, so over the, over the two years combined, most of the, mo when you put those together, the, the kind of equity gaps among race, racial and ethnic groups look relatively small um, in terms of the overall rate of decline uh, at say four-year schools. Black students and Native American students are still doing far worse than other groups at community colleges. But you, you, you also have to kind of factor in some of the underlying demographics when you look at the race and ethnicity uh, numbers. Because, I mean, a perfect example is that uh, uh, Latinx students are, are showing relatively smaller, quite a bit smaller declines in, in both sectors over the two-year period in, in community colleges and in four-year institutions. Um, but those that population is actually growing quite rapidly and has been for years. So, um, yes. Yes. you know, when you account for the underlying population demographics, and, and I'm talking about co traditional college-age students, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, uh, Hispanic students should be growing. So the fact that they're declining less, <laughs> you have to kind of factor in that that context that the relative decline is is still quite large. Felix had a, a, a clarifying question. He asked, "Gaps in total numbers or as a percentage?" Yeah. So these are all, all, all everything I'm talking about is gaps as a percentage. Um, it's much harder to talk about total numbers because the underlying populations are so different in terms of total size. Yeah. Uh, great question, Felix. And Doug, thank you for the very thoughtful answer. Uh, and Felix, since Felix's institution, the California State University System, does fantastic work working with underserved minorities in that state. Uh, we have uh, another question that came up, and it was a great one from the chat, and it's so great I wanted to hoist it up into a live video question. So I'm going to bring the speaker, uh, Will Emerson from Lansing, Michigan, uh, to actually ask it in person. Hello, Will. Hey, how are you? Hi. Well, good to see both of you. So I have just a comment real quick before I ask my question. So regarding Free Community College, you know, here in Michigan, community colleges get a great deal of support from local millages. So I was in a conversation recently, it was a, a statewide conversation, had various people just from around Michigan on it. And one of the things that was put forward was the idea that community college is free. That's going to potentially cut into local support for millages. After all, why pay into a millage for something you get for free? And so it's not necessarily something that everybody in the community college sector is interested in, free college uh, here in Michigan. So, but for some institutions, that's 20% of their total funding is that, that millage. And uh, one of the questions put forward was, what evidence is there that free community colleges will see an appreciable bump in enrollment? So they may lose that millage support, but at the same time, not necessarily see big gains in enrollment. So that's just on the previous point. My question for you, and the reason Brian brought me up here, I asked about uh, apprenticeships. I'm curious, does NSC track apprenticeship numbers? If so, have you seen growth in apprenticeships? And I'm specifically interested in apprenticeships in non-traditional areas, such as healthcare and IT. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a really good question. And unfortunately, we don't track apprenticeships. We really are, are right now only able to count actual uh, credit enrollments, um, for the most part, for, for credit enrollments. A, a portion of the colleges also submit data on non-credit enrollments, but it's not as complete. So it's harder to talk authoritatively about a non-credit enrollment. So we mostly talk about the four credit side. Um, uh, but it's definitely something that we're working on. We'd love to be able to uh, uh, measure those phenomena as well. Yeah, it's interesting. A lot of apprenticeships, as you know, the related trade instruction is done through, well, like my institution, Lansing Community College. We do RTI for paramedics, 
rad tax, you name it, lots of different areas. So yeah. there would be a, a credit for credit component to it, but then there's also the on the job training. So it'd be interesting to see how okay. honestly moving forward may or may not end up tracking that. Yeah. See, this is the, this is the problem, Doug, with success. Success always means people want you to do more work. <laughs> do more work. <laughs> and Will, Will, thank you for yeah. thank you for the work you do there. Uh, this is great stuff. Well, I certainly appreciate this opportunity to speak, and I always love these uh, these conversations. So, thank thanks to both of, both of you. Appreciate it. Our pleasure. Take care. Yep. Thanks for the question. Uh, so you can see video questions are great. Um, you don't have to have a beard in order to participate. I mean, it, it, it helps a little bit, but, you know, it's optional. Uh, we have more questions just piling in, Doug, like, like mad. Uh, let me bring up one from a, a great person, Regina Uribe uh, from Guild Education, who asks, what barriers are in place that prevent access and collection of better data? A lot of current data focuses on first-time, full-time students, but the profile of learner demographics is changing. That's a, that, yeah. Well, at the clearinghouse, uh, we don't have that kind of barrier. Aside from that, that uh, non-credit side that I talked about, we do collect, uh, and everything I've been talking about is total enrollments, regardless of whether they're full-time or part-time, we're counting headcounts, um, and we're counting students, like students who uh, transfer, students who transfer in, transfer out. We keep track of all the all the different uh, pathways among and between institutions that students are students are, tra are traversing. So um, even even if they change states, you know we're 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 counting the same students all the time. Um, Good point. Good point. It's a uh, uh, it's a, it's a huge huge research effort. I mean, Doug, Doug, how many people do you employ now just to do this? Well, let's see. The clearinghouse as a whole uh, is somewhat over 300 now. Wow. Our research center is on about a dozen or so. So that's, that's uh, incredible. But, yeah. I mean, the, you know, so all of the data comes from the clearinghouse. So most of those people are involved in the collection and processing and storing of the data that comes in from the colleges and working with the colleges and universities to make sure that the that the data are are uh, um, are consistent and accurate uh, and then i get the fun we get the fun part of, of of analyzing it once it's here slicing it and dicing it that's it regina good question and if you if you want to follow up uh, of course we're, we're happy to hear more we have a question from a digital pedagogy specialist at Bucknell University. It's Leslie Harris. And she asks, do you think the reduction in enrollment in New York universities is related to the loss of college age students in the Northeast in general, or do you think there are other reasons for that decline? So back to New York question. Yeah, I, I think it's it's definitely multiple reasons. I, and I think it certainly starts with the declining population of college age students. Um, and we're seeing that uh, effect uh, in across the Northeast and in the Midwest as well. If you look over the last two years, those regions um, actually uh, going back at least I think five years in our data, those regions have declined the most um, in total enrollments compared to the South and the West. Um, yeah. But I think there are also uh, um, economic factors that go along with that population decline. And particularly if you look at um, the economies in some of, in, in many of these states, not just New York, right south here in Pennsylvania, in many areas of the state, you're also seeing both population decline and economic uh, challenges. And that's affecting um, uh, state uh, and state-supported enrollments uh, as well. Yeah, a great question, um, uh, Leslie. Thank you. We, we had an interesting point here from the chat. Joel Bloom notes that enrollment in the four-year CUNY City University of New York institutions has been steady to the top four or five of them. Um, I, I think I think Leslie was referring to the whole CUNY system. Leslie, if I'm if I'm wrong, please let me know. Um, but uh, I'm I'm glad to see CUNY doing well. They do great stuff with, with very little in the way of resources. Um, 
Peter Gray has a question, and uh, I have to read this out loud carefully. Uh, given the patterns noted, uh, declining enrollments at less selective two-year publics with four-year private for-profits, what would one project about online versus in-person enrollments at such institutions, i.e. drawn to or move away from online? Peter, how'd I do? And Doug, did that make sense? Did I... Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, it's that's a great question. I, and I don't really know what to make of this one, partly because our our data doesn't track which students are online and which students are in person in the traditional in in the uh, in most campuses. So, so institutions like now where everybody's online, it's not a big deal, but um, we, we identify what we call and what, what the Department of Education calls primarily online institutions. And those, you know, they're defined as uh, having at least 90% of their students enrolling online. Um, and so we can, we can show what's happened in those types of institutions. And it's, it's hard to it's hard to make much sense. They've actually they they uh, did very well last year in the first year of the pandemic. They increased their enrollments in many cases. This year they're doing less well. They're they're actually among the steepest declines um, compared to uh, um, um, non POI primarily online institutions we call them. Um, but it's the it's the large institutions that nowadays, you know, might have half of their students online, or all their students might be half online and half in person. Mm. Um, and we don't really have a way to, to understand where that's happening and, and whether that's growing or not. Well, that's a, that's a great question. And I, I Doug, I really appreciate your being candid about this. Um, I mean, sometimes this feels like beating up fog trying to get a handle on it. Um, um, we have a, a quick question from uh, Mark Bernard DeFosco, who was asking a clarifying question. Do you track uh, student working hours? That is, when students are studying, do you track how many hours per week they work, for example? No, no. Another one that I, uh, we'd love to be able to do, but we don't have any information on unemployment. Understood. Good, good no. question, Mark. Good question. Uh, we also have a question slash mash note from uh, Greg, uh, who begins by saying, Doug is brilliant. I'm incredibly grateful to Clearinghouse for being a tremendous asset and resource for those of us working in higher ed. Uh, so then here comes the question. Does he see trends in enrollment and completion data for colleges that are likely to close or merge? The greater consolidation among publics. So can the Clearinghouse predict future consolidation? Mm. <laughs> wow. Um, not yet, but check back in a year. We so this is actually what. Well, this is actually an area that we are studying now. Uh, we're we're about uh, we're just getting getting rolling on a um, a really interesting collaboration with uh, with SHEO, the State Higher Education Executive Officers Group. Um, to study uh, college closures over the last 10 years, say, and try to understand really what happens after that, not so much what happens before that. Um, so maybe we can't predict closures, but what we're, what we're really interested in is what's the impact on the student? And, can, and, what, and we're trying to see all the students who were enrolled when that college shut down how many of them successfully transferred and finished a degree somewhere else? And how does that compare to similar students at colleges that didn't close? And looking for ways that state policymakers, for example, might be able to uh, make uh, 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 adjustments that would, that would help to protect students and uh, uh, keep them on track to, to reaching their educational goals when their college does shut down? Well, it's a great question. And uh, um, I'm, I'm going to look forward to your SHEO collaboration. And, and this time next year, perhaps, we'll uh, circle back and bring you back on to see uh, 
what kind of um, Isaac Asimov foundation level uh, predictability um, you can have. Um, we had uh, another question from Lee Nichols out of Western Carolina uh, about another demographic slice, which was, we're seeing a shift towards more female versus male students. Is that more widespread? And if so, any indicators for why that shift is happening? Ah, uh, yes, the gender, the growing gender divide. We, we've definitely, uh, uh, there's definitely been a broader trend there. Um, we saw, you know, about two thirds of last year's decline uh, were made up was made up of men, male students, and that was especially surprising to us, particularly because you know the men only make up about forty percent of total enrollments to begin with. So they were there; they were declining at about twice the rate, the percentage rate, as females were, particularly at again at community colleges. Um, this year, the gender gap has equalized somewhat. Uh, women actually declined more than men did in 2021. Um, um, so over the over, if you look at the two years combined from 2019 to 2021, uh, men are still ha have fallen somewhat more steeply than women, but they're 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 more close to parity. Um, again, it's it's hard to understand the forces that might be behind that. Last year, we talked a lot about the direct effect of the pandemic and the recession and how, uh, particularly for lower income uh, communities uh, that are that uh, where a lot of community college students come from, those seem to have different uh, impacts on men and women. Women, uh, by most accounts, were more likely to be at home last year, managing uh, child care, family care, particularly when K-12 schools shut down. Um, and um, it seemed that that could have, could have enabled them to make, keep up their studies online if they were yeah. already enrolled. Whereas men, I think, were more likely to be uh, out working frontline jobs. Um, trying to keep earnings coming in. And um, we saw that the community college programs, when we looked at majors uh, that overwhelmingly enroll men, like security and protective services, firefighting, uh, manufacturing programs, um, those programs just fell off a cliff in terms of enrollments. And I think that's partly because, again, men didn't have the, the time to be in, enrolling. They were much more focused on, on trying to uh, keep the family finances in, in uh, particularly older men, um, intact. And also, I think the colleges had, in many of those cases, more difficulty transitioning those instructional programs into online delivery modes in the first place. Um, that's a that's a huge huge model for an answer. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, what's a lot that? of a lot of intersecting forces, you know. Aren't aren't we close to about sixty percent of the student body is now female and about forty percent male? That's right. That's right. Okay. That's, for that's all, for all undergraduates, yeah. And, and this is brand new. Yeah, this is new in American history. Yeah, yeah. Although, although it's been pretty close to that. I mean, it only shifted by maybe one or two percentage points in the last year. Um, you know, women have been um, uh, gaining ground very steadily for decades, mm -hmm. and um, uh, over the last ten years, they've been holding pretty pretty close. It, in the upper 58, upper 57, 58% range of total enrollments. Great question. We can do a whole session on this, and, and I, yeah. I think we should if we can get some uh, um, some some more uh, more research on this. Uh, we also have a wonderful person to ask a question. This is the splendid David Scobie uh, from Bring Theory to Practice. 
and always a delight to hear from David. So he has a great, great subtle question. Let's bring him up on stage. And this is actually so neat. I'm actually going to arrange the stage in a cool way. Watch this. See, that's pretty cool. Hello, David. Hey, uh, Brian. Thank you for, as always, for uh, these conversations. And I want to say how much I admire the work of the National Clearinghouse. It's really indispensable. Um, I want to go back, Doug, to one of the earliest things you said, kind of speculating about the forces underneath these declines and that it wasn't just an immediate response to the pandemic. And you, you brought together two things that are often thought to go side by side. And I, I, I want to trouble that and see what you think. You, you rightly talked about growing economic anxiety and anxiety about completion. In other words, the things that might constrain the decision to go to college or make it seem like a bad decision. Um, and link that to the story that people go to college now primarily for job security and job mobility. And I want to separate out economic anxiety about constraints from economic aspirations. You, you might want to go to college for all kinds of holistic reasons, for well-being, for community care, along with job mobility, but still decide not to do it for all the kind of cost or completion worries that that you were talking about. And uh, in our work, I'm, I'm more skeptical that students only have the job aspiration, it seems to me. They might have more rich, they might have richer aspirations, but that are short circuited by the material anxieties that you're talking about. How do we, how do we tease those apart so that we can understand aspirations as different from constraints and, and use that to try to change the cultural narrative a bit in the face of these headlines. It's really interesting. You know, one of the things that we saw this year that I think helps to, to, to um, separate those two, and I think you're right, there's definitely those, those, those factors weigh very differently on different types of students. And part of that is, is I think what's shown up in the, in, in the data this year when we looked at four-year colleges by selectivity. And, and a really different picture from last year when we did that. So last year, if you look at, if you, if you compare the rates of enrollment decline, among the different barons categories of four-year colleges, so admissions selectivity, that's the only criterion there. Um, they all look the same. There's very little difference. Uh, the declines were consistent across the board, especially among incoming new freshmen. And that's where this decision is being made, I think that, we're, that you're focusing on. This year, completely different thing. The, the top tier and only the top tier had increases in number of incoming freshmen, the most selective public and private nonprofits. And all the others to continued to decline, and the less selective they were, the steeper the declines. So I think that gets at exactly the distinction that you're talking about, that it, it the, the students from, and I'll I'll be, I'll be, you know, I'll use a very broad brush because it's a generalization here, but students attending less selective, broad access colleges are much more likely to be low or middle income students who are, in my view, going to be much more focused on that ROI and less, less, uh, um, well, compared to the students at the top institutions who are much, much more likely to be high inc from high income families, they are more likely to be interested in education for its own sake and less have less, less of an anxiety regardless about their economic futures. I, I'm not even, I'm not willing to go there with you yet. <laughs> I mean, it's clear that the but the, the less selective institutions where, where uh, lower income and working class kids are going, those, those families are going to be way more driven by economic anxiety and the, the, the damage done by the recession and the long-term inequality 
uh, crisis. I'm not sure we know enough yet about the the aspirations of those students who who might decide whose families might decide not to have them go to college, but who still might view college as more than just an, an economic ROI. Um, and, and I'd like to figure that out because we we tend to we tend to equate uh, those two factors mm -hmm. uh, together. Right. Um, that you've done enough. You, you, everything you do is great in terms of get, giving us data. I think the rest of us need to figure out that research about aspirations. Yeah, I mean, you, it's true. You can't really answer that question with the level of data that we have. Um, I can speculate like I do <laughs> based on which students and which institutions. But to really get at that, you have to you have to talk to students. You have to you have to survey and and look at look at why they're going and yeah. Brian, can I just add one more quick comment to it? Doug said you, I You just did, but you can add uh, more, please. <laughs> um, I uh, I think the focus on student well being and mental health as a driver mm -hmm. of these decisions also points to kind of other factors that that we need to mm -hmm. take into account in addition to the job security cost anxiety kinds of issues yeah well, that may be uh, one of the outcomes of this pandemic um, is that we have more of that wraparound full service uh, support david uh, thank you and everybody please follow bring theory to practice they do very very important work thank you thank you uh, friends, we're almost out of time. Uh, we're coming up, up real, really close, really close to the end of the hour, and I want to make sure that everyone gets their chance to have their say and to share their thoughts. Uh, we've got a couple of quick questions I want to bring in. Here's one from Bart Trudeau, uh, and Bart asks, "Can you comment on anticipated changes in international enrollment?" Mm. Uh, I don't know what to anticipate there. I've been I've been puzzling already in what we've seen in the data uh, about the um, disparity in international students between undergraduate and graduate students. It's no different from the disparity overall, where undergraduates are are falling steeply, graduate students are increasing consistently, um, and. So why um, international students, I can understand why, uh, my assumption was that international students would be dropping across the board. And yet graduate students, uh, international students, seem to be doing just fine. So perhaps uh, they'll keep doing fine um, on the grad school side. That may be. Good question. Good question. I mean, this is a, a, a huge topic, and I, I love the way that everybody in the forum is, is tackling it from different angles, from gender, from race, uh, from uh, international and national status. Um, we have uh, uh, a comment slash question from Mark at Tuition Fit. And Mark, I hope I don't garble this here. Uh, there's also the notion of simply not having an aspiration uh, without a clear sense of aspiration. A higher reluctance to enroll. That's interesting. Not quite sure what to make of that. Uh, well, I guess I guess Mark, are you thinking, for example, of the the, the so-called Great Resignation, with uh, a lot of uh, low-wage workers just uh, pulling out and wanting to seek something else, or are you referring to students per, or would-be students, perhaps just not having a lot of aspirations, um, a kind of great slacking, if you will. Uh, please, please toss in more or raise your hand. We'd be glad to bring you on stage. Um, while he's thinking about that, we had uh, a really nice, concise question from Lee Nichols. I'll bring this back because this is a nice one to finish up on. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Hang on, hang on. Wait, bring on Mark. He just jumped on stage. Here he is. Hello, Mark. Hello. Um, yes, I, I've been known for posing uh, questions that were more Mark than anything. Um, so in a, a previous uh, stage member was, I think it was David was talking about the difference between going to college for job prospects versus going to college for your aspirations of such. And, and one thing that, that also might be in there is that, that 
especially for the traditional student and I would say the traditional student up to age 24 is is that just simply not really being at a maturity level where you really have a clear sense of asp what aspiration it is like um, and given the sort of possibility of debt that maybe the, they just sit back and say well until I have a clear sense of aspiration I'm just not going to pursue this at all hmm. Yeah, that was a great. Yeah, it makes sense, but but I I think that it particularly makes sense for for traditional age students. I think that's kind of who you have in mind, and and one of the things that that um, you know continues to puzzle me about what we've seen in the last two years is the 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 absence of any kind of regular uh, uh, recession effect of older students um, who um, particularly, you know, in every recession that we've looked at and over the last, you, you can go back 30, 40 years, um, older students uh, flock to community colleges when the unemployment rates go up. Uh, they're looking to reskill and aspiration or not, they're they, if you're out of work, your opportunity costs are low. It makes perfect economic sense to invest. It. You know, you know the story. Yep. It didn't happen this time. The pandemic completely broke the recession in that respect. Right. Well, we certainly don't have a prior model where <laughs> had, I see your recession and I raise you a pandemic like we didn't. <laughs> so, um, you know, combine that with uh, what many of us saw was you know, institutions moving to online, um, but not really moving to high quality online education, just sort of taking all of their classes online quickly, just because they had to do it some way. Mm -hmm. And as a function of that, uh, an awful lot of, of the reputation or the word on the street was, yeah, that online class from XYZ Community College is worse than being in person. And why would I even do that? So um, you're right. All of this stuff threw, threw this thing into a real uh, topsy-turvy, who knows what. Oh. Yeah, I think you're right. You you had to be really, it's not just, a, just aspiration. You had to be really determined and committed, um, I think, to, to stick with an all online experience, um, especially when so much of the rest of your life was online, too, last yes. year. I never heard anyone say, give me more Zoom. Yeah. Well, we tried to do it better. Um, <laughs> Mark, thank you. Thank you for the great question and clarifying it. And you see, having a beard helps for getting on stage. Um, and, uh, Someday I will be like you. Someday. Well, well, you're great now. And thanks for the work of tuition fit. Thank you. We'll talk. Um, but I'm afraid we're past the top of the hour, so we have to pull up stakes and, and, and end. Doug, you've been a fantastic guest. I, I admire how you are able to communicate so concisely and so elegantly from such a swarm, a vast amount of information uh, so clearly. Thank you very much. Um, what's, the, what's the best way to keep up with you in the Clearinghouse? Uh, well, through that convenient link that you posted on our for our website. Okay, we'll keep doing that. Everybody keep doing that. You can, you can, there's a link actually when you follow that, uh, that gives you an opportunity to subscribe for our uh, blogs and press uh, updates when new reports come out. And, uh, Good. Yeah. And you should all do that. And uh, thanks to uh, Todd Sedmak for all of his work on that end. Um, Doug, once again, thank you so much. Please uh, take care, keep doing the great work, and uh, all our applause to your hardworking team. Great. Well, and thank you for putting on this show again, and thanks to all of your amazing uh, uh, participants for the great questions and great engagement on, on, these, on these topics. It's been a lot of fun. They are wonderful. Thank you, Doug. But don't go, friends. Let me just show you where we are for the next uh, couple of weeks. And I just want to second Doug's praise. These are great questions. Thank you all. Uh, looking ahead, we're going to leap from enrollment to talking about disability, eco-media literacy, the climate crisis, research universities, libraries, minority students on campus. If you'd like to learn more about those and sign up for them, just go to forum.futureofeducation.us.
if you want to keep this discussion going, everything from student aspirations to the differences between demographics and states, just head to Twitter and use the hashtag FTTE or hit me up at my blog, brianalexander.org. Uh, if you'd like to go into our past and look at our previous session with Doug or sessions having to do with any of these other topics, just go to our archive at tinyurl.com slash FTF archive. And if you'd like to keep talking, come join us again next week. We're always glad to see you. We're really grateful to all of you for thinking together uh, as we approach collaboratively the future of higher education. Until then, keep up the great work, everybody. Stay safe, and we'll see you online. Bye-bye.